Now again, everybody, uh, I hope you've enjoyed Abhishek's talk. It's me again, and I promise this is the last time you'll hear from me uh, this week. I've got both of my sessions out of the way on the right at the beginning of the conference. This talks about what's new in, in CloudStack uh, 416. Uh, and it's great to see so many people joining in the sessions, asking so many questions and everything. I encourage you to carry on, uh, carry on doing so for this session as well. Those of you who don't know me, I'm Giles. Uh, I've been a uh, committer and PMC member of CloudStack since 2014. I'm chairman of the CloudStack European User Group. Uh, when I'm not working in the community, I'm CEO of, of, of Shape Blue. We're a company that, that work 100% with Apache CloudStack. In my spare time, I do lots of things. I like to go sailing. Uh, I've got two growing children. I'm a hiker uh, and I'm a recovering software engineer, uh, although I haven't written a line of code for quite a few years uh, now. If anybody wants to get hold of me, there's my Twitter handle and two different email addresses. Uh, oh, just to mention before we continue, uh, Nicholas, I'll explain in a second, who is the release manager for, for 416, is also, he's not going to present, but he's around for the questions if we get any really detailed uh, questions. So I'm just going to do some uh, some basic information on the, on the release and then just look at the different categories of, of new functionality. Uh, in this talk, I'm not going to talk through all the hundreds of bug fixes and minor enhancements. Uh, you can read the release notes for all of those. I'm just going to focus on the, the, the you know, the, the high level of, of the big, new, interesting things. And I did just mention Nicholas, but uh, if everybody could give Nicholas a virtual round of applause. Nicholas is the, was the release manager of 416, and that job is often... Uh, compared to herding cats, right? So one of the great things about an open source community is, you know, lots of creativity, lots of ideas, lots of people putting in amazing functionality just because they want to or it suits their organization. And it's the job of the release manager to get all of that, bash all of that into shape and get it ready for release to ensure it can be tested and, and formally released. Uh, it's taken a few months of really hard effort on, on uh, Nicholas's uh, uh, side. So well done. Thank you very much, Nicholas, from the whole community. So this release, uh, I read this morning, we've, we've 244 new features, improvements and bug fixes, right? So it's, it, there's 244 PRs basically in the, uh, in, in the release. Of those, 22 uh, are major new features. Uh, 416 is an LTS release. Uh, which will mean that the community informally agrees to maintain it for, for the next 18 months. Uh, it's actually not released yet. The, the, the official release, I think, is in about one week's time. The final vote, I think, on the, 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 the third release candidate is about to finish. Literally today is due to finish. And I had a quick look before we started. There's no minus ones there. Uh, so... I can't see any reason that the 15th won't be the date that it's 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 actually released. Let's start to have a look at uh, some of the new features. First of all, we've got some support for some new Linux distributions. Uh, Rocky Linux version 8, OpenSUSE, SUSE 15.2 and 15.3, both on the management server side and as uh, KVM hypervisors. Uh, one of the, you know, the things CloudStack settled, settled on uh, CentOS for a long, long time, but with the changes that's gone on at CentOS, we've had to look to more and more different distributions because people don't seem to be settling on any any particular distribution. So we've got a wide range of Linux distribution support now, and these, these are the, 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 the two latest. We've got a couple of major new storage uh, integrations that have come into to 4.16 uh, that have come from... Uh, you know, pretty pretty significant vendors. And the first one is some integration uh, for Dell PowerFlex. So we've now got a plugin. Uh, for those of you who don't know, we've got two different ways of doing primary storage with, with, with CloudStack. We can do it the basic way, or we can go with what we call managed storage, which is where CloudStack doesn't just see a load of NFS. What it sees is, uh, is something very specific to that, that, that storage. 
Uh, and that allows us to start to use in CloudStack some of the more advanced features of that particular storage platform. For years, we, we, we've had we've had a number of vendors who have got uh, managed storage plugins for CloudStack, but in one release, we've got two new vendors uh, who, who, who have got plugins. First one's Dell PowerFlex. This was uh, you know, a few years ago, it was Scale.io, they got acquired by Dell EMC or uh, yeah, it was Dell EMC at the time, and this is now known as Dell PowerFlex, uh, and it's a distributed localized storage uh, platform. We've now got a plugin that allows uh, CloudStack to directly manage storage pools uh, and enable a whole range of advanced functionality uh, from on on on, a, on the PowerFlex uh, platform. Uh, supports a whole range of VM lifecycle operations, deploying system VMs, user VMs, start, stop, restart, restart destroy VMs, snapshots, migrations, etc. And then a whole range of stuff on volume lifecycle operations as well. So it's really good. That's the first, you know, major new storage integration we've, we've had for some time. So that's really exciting. And <laughs> here's the, the best thing, right? We've, in one release, we've got two. We've also got... Uh, the guys from Limbit uh, have have done a very similar thing uh, for their storage, their distributed storage platform from Linstore, and it's very similar functionality to what I was talking about with the Dell EMC thing. Uh, Linstore is slightly different in that it's uh, an open source solution, so we, we are we get quite excited about that. But we see very uh, interesting things with more vendors coming into CloudStack now and wanting to, to develop these, these, these storage plugins. Uh, okay, the next set of uh, new features in 4.16, got a set of changes to the uh, CloudStack Kubernetes service, a set of new features in that. For those of you who don't know, uh, CKS is an integration point between CloudStack and Kubernetes. And it lets you deploy cloud, uh, Kubernetes clusters directly into CloudStack and takes care of all the plumbing behind the scenes. So it's taking away the headache of you having to deploy your own Kubernetes clusters. And CKS has been around since I think version 4.14 of CloudStack, but quite a significant new piece of functionality. It's now got, we've now added auto scaling. Uh, ability of Kubernetes to say to CloudStack, I need more uh, nodes in my cluster, okay? And the way it does that, it has a, a thing called the CloudStack Cloud Provider, which is like a, a driver, if you like, for Kubernetes or, 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 or for CloudStack. And Kubernetes will notify that, uh, that provider when it's getting to the point where it just can't schedule pods because it hasn't got enough resources. That provider will then notify CloudStack and say, "Look, I need I need more virtual machines. I need I need more virtual infrastructure to support that cluster." Uh, and likewise, uh, the other way around, uh, if nodes are sitting there idle and they haven't got any uh, uh, current workload, the provider will can can auto scale those those back down. It still respects the minimum and maximum uh, settings that can be put in for the for the cluster within CloudStack. And this is only supported for Kubernetes version 116 and above. When you deploy a Kubernetes cluster in CloudStack, you can choose the version of Kubernetes that you're going to deploy into CloudStack, and auto scaling will only work for 116 and above. One of the things that's really interesting to me now is now we've got the CloudStack cloud provider handling auto scaling. It's opened up a another whole world of things that we can further integrations we can do in the CloudStack Kubernetes service. Uh, the other improvement that's been made uh, with CKS is uh, we've now removed the, the core OS templates. As, as I'm sure most people are aware, core OS has gone end of life. Uh, and unfortunately, CloudStack Container Service use core OS templates uh, un underneath the, the Kubernetes clusters. Uh, a lot of work was was done in terms of researching what what should be the correct thing to form these templates. What should be the correct distribution? The decision was made in the end to base it actually on the existing CloudStack uh, system VM template because that gives the advantages, of course, of simplicity of management. Right. So we've only got one thing to deal with. We haven't got a separate set of templates for for Kubernetes. They're based on Debian, and that's just going to mean simplified ongoing management. 
probably the biggest area uh, we've we've seen improvements in 416 is is in the user interface. 415, uh, well actually 414 gave us the new look user interface, which has had overwhelmingly uh, positive feedback. 415 was when that was GA and the old interface was was deprecated. But there's a whole world of uh, new things that are coming, well, in both in this version and in future versions. Now we've got uh, a more manageable in user interface. There's a whole world of things we can do to start to make people's lives a little bit easier on a sort of day-to-day -day basis. Uh, this is one of, I think this is probably my favorite feature uh, of, of this whole release, actually. It might seem quite simple and a lot of people might say, you should have always been able to do that in Cloud Stack. But now with, with most object types, I can now multi-select on, uh, on the left-hand side. I'll probably demo some of this if we've got time at the end. And then apply relevant actions to that multiple selection. So for example, I want to reboot uh, 10 virtual machines. Select those 10 virtual machines, uh, hit the restart button, off we go. I want to uh, deactivate 10 user accounts. Select those, select those 10 user accounts, press deactivate. Uh, this looks quite simple, but there's a lot of work in terms of identifying what the what actions could be applied to multi-select objects. Uh, it's not everywhere in CloudStack. It's all of the places you really need it, though. So if you look, there's just a, a list of all of the different object types and the different actions uh, that, that you can actually do a multi-select on now. The next UI improvement uh, is uh, a PR that was titled Custom Resource Icons. And this is all about giving CloudStack or, or giving you as operators of CloudStack the ability to make it seem more graphical. And what I can do is pretty much for any object now in CloudStack, Cloud if you see next to that object, just hang my mouse over it there, uh, this little camera button, that means you can upload a specific resource icon for that resource. So here's an example, and this is probably the 101 example for this. Uh, I've got a zone. Uh, my zone has a very long name that's got Nicholas's name in it, but let's just pretend that's that's called called London or it's called my UK zone. Uh, I hit that little camera. I select the icon I want for it. I crop it. I resize it, and that zone will now be represented with that icon as well as its name. And it's not just zones. I can use this for templates. I can use this for uh, instances. I can use this for networks. I can use it for absolutely anything. And it immediately, just by that one thing, so that's an action there. Only obviously a domain admin would be able to go in and configure a zone because a user wouldn't be able to do that. But by doing that, uh, when somebody chooses a new instance, it's now got my flag. When somebody uh, looks for a zone in a drop down list, it's got the flag. When somebody sees the zone mentioned anywhere in CloudStack, it's graphically rep represented. And as I mentioned, you know, it's not just for zones, it's for all sorts of different objects. And a number of these aren't just, uh, aren't just uh, administrator functions either. Basically, any object that I have access to as a user, I can create a new icon for. So for example, if I had a set of database servers, I might want to give them a different icon to a set of application servers. Uh, as a user, I can upload a picture of myself. So other people, wherever they see my username can, can see my picture. And it's all just making the CloudSec UI more graphical and, and just easier for, for, for people to follow. The next UI improvement is uh, a feature called object comments. And this is the ability to, <laughs> sounds quite simple, just put a text comment next to any object. Again, those objects are virtual machines, they're networks, they're, they're, they're whatever you want to comment against. And again, think of that same model as the icons. Uh, it's about what you have access to. So a user is only going to be able to leave comments against a, you know, a subset of things, whereas a domain administrator is going to be able to comment against infrastructure components and, and what have you. Now these are structured. So the idea is if I create a, a, a comment next to an object, it's recorded with a date stamp with my user ID. They are not editable. Uh, they can be deleted, but they're maintained. Uh, they're just marked for deletion in the database, so you can choose whatever policy you, you want about that. Admins can comment on, on any object, and then users just comment uh, against things that they obviously have access to. 
and the logic here one of the there's lots of potential use cases but being able to build up effectively a loose config history a maintenance history being able to comment uh, the reason configuration changes were made against an object and there's a sort of cascading model as well so as an administrator uh, I will every I, I can make comments that can only be seen by other administrators or can be seen against all users and users can choose whether their comments are, are public or private as well you know an object's got comments next to it because it has this little ellipse this little blue ellipse and then when you look at any object so for example this is a, a, a virtual machine as well as the details volumes etc etc we've got a comments section which shows the comments there sorted uh, reverse date order and you can also go in the main menu uh, under the tool sections comments where you can view the comments for all of your comments and as an administrator everybody else's comments as well across all of the object types that you've got comments for so you know could answer a number of different use cases uh, but I know of a number of organizations who have been desperate for something like this in CloudStack for some time so uh, interesting to hear what what other people make of it going forward okay so moving off the uh, moving off the user interface um, we've got a whole set of things which I'm just calling improved tools and, and management it's just a sort of neat classification for them uh, first of all there's been some significant uh, improvements to the upgrade process uh, so the VM template, I mean, I'm guessing everybody here would raise their hand if I asked them to, to raise their hand. The VM template has always been a pain during the upgrade because you had to go and manually uh, register the VM template first before on your packages. And if you forgot to do it, it could cause all sorts of bother. That is now handled as part of the package upgrade process. So that's just been removed as a manual process that, that people need to worry about. Uh, and then the database upgrade script which I've misspelt there, I apologize for, the database upgrade script uh, can now be run independently without root user credentials. And this is to address uh, a requirement that a lot of organizations are starting to have where they've got a separate database team, separate DBA team, uh, a separate sort of effectively corporate root admin team, and they needed to make sure that user credentials for things like that could could be siloed so that can be run independently without root uh, credentials we've now got enhanced functionality for importing and exporting instances and some of you will remember i think it was in 415 uh we had a a, a new piece of api functionality called vm ingestion and this allowed you to take VMware instances in, in an existing vSphere cluster and bring them under CloudStack's management, add them into CloudStack and say to CloudStack, you go and manage, manage them, effectively importing them, although it wasn't physically moving the VM because the way CloudStack integrates with VMware, it, it, talks, it talks through vCenter. Uh, and likewise, you could also use that to unmanage instances to effectively export them from, from CloudStack. That functionality, was initially designed effectively as a batch process tool. That's why it was uh, initially on the API. It's now been moved if, as, as a admin tool in the user interface. So I can go in here, import, export instances, uh, look at all of the managed instances in a given cluster, look at all of the unmanaged instances in a given cluster. Uh, obviously this is only relevant to, to VMware clusters. Uh, and then I can choose to actually go and import uh, sp specific instances or, or a range of instances. And during that process, uh, I'm going to get prompted for the for the name, the domain, the project, what template I want to base it on. And it's quite nice if you don't have a specific template in mind, it, it will actually create a temporary template to base that instance on for you. Uh, what compute offering, network, how to assign the IP address and everything. And that just lets you bring a VMware instance under CloudStack control. Uh, not in 4.16, but hopefully in future releases, I think you're going to see a lot more work going on around importing, exporting of virtualized infrastructure to and from CloudStack to, to, to different places. A couple of uh, 
reasonably significant things just to, to sort of finish off here. Uh, we've now on cloud stack HA got a degraded state. Uh, and before we didn't have this option. Uh, and what this is effectively doing is giving us the ability to mark a host as being degraded. Before, if you marked it as down, cloud stack would try and shut that host down. But now I can say this host is degraded which is going to trigger a host HA event to take workloads off that host, but it will leave the host running. Uh, and I've got a couple of new, a couple of new uh, API commands and user interface components. Uh, so I can now, now manage multiple IP ranges uh, for a pod. Uh, and I can also now update uh, VLAN ranges as well. Uh, that is pretty much the end of my presentation. I want to leave a little bit of time for q and I think there's a, a few questions flying through now. I'm just going to take five minutes and be very brave and try and do a live demo uh, just of, of so, some of these things. I'll probably just look at the, the, the UI stuff. Uh, I hope the demo gods are with me. Just give me a second. Okay, so this is 416. Uh, I'm going to log in as an admin. Init no, actually, I'll log in as a user. Init I want to change my mind again. I'm going to log in as an admin. Okay, so this is just a, 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 a virtualized environment in our lab that I've just uh, created for this demo. Uh, so let's just look at the multi-select uh, bulk actions I was talking about before. And as I said, this can be used in a number of different areas. Uh, I'm going to be the most common place. So I've got a, a few VMs in here. Uh, let's, oops, mouse button, excuse me. Uh, let's pick a few VMs there. And then now I've got the actions that I can apply to that, that group of VMs. So I'm going to literally just reboot the instance. I'm going to get prompted. Uh, you get a strong, much stronger prompt if you're doing something like a delete. Uh, obviously, you could select a whole bunch of things. And I've got all the same settings I'd have here, whether I force, et cetera, uh, as I have for, for a normal restart operation. Uh, and it tells me. Uh, what the success has been. Oh, something failed. Fair enough. Okay, I need to know about that. And I know why that is because I did something to that VM earlier. But it gives me a, 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 a sort of report on how successful that's been. So that can be used. And if you notice, that's asynchronous as well. Uh, that's uh, that, that report there. And anywhere you see the checkbox there next to objects, you can use that for uh, for this multi selection. Uh, the other thing you will notice is next to some of these VMs is uh, the little comments thing that I, I was talking about. Uh, and if I click on that, maybe I go straight into the comments section of that object itself. Uh, I'm logged in as an administrator here. Uh, I'll make a note just to show this at CCC. Okay. I can choose whether this is only visible to administrators or visible to anybody. Off I go. That's recorded with a with a date stamp, etc. And then, as I talked about before, with these comments, I've got a specific comments section where I can see. I'm an admin here. I'm just seeing my own comments. But as an administrator, I can go and see all comments. So there's an account called Giles here. Uh, whether they're only visible to administrators, et cetera, et cetera, and then dive into that machine or that, that object and, and go and look at those comments. Uh, the other thing, resource icons, custom icons. So I'll, I'll just walk you through the example I showed earlier. Uh, obviously, as an administrator, I can go into the infrastructure. A user wouldn't be able to do this, but I've got one zone here called London, and London actually has some comments on it. So before I make any changes, I could go and look at those comments. The comments simply saying it's being added for the for a new data center. And anywhere you see the camera like here, I can go in and I can then go and choose the icon I want for this. 
okay size it zoom it whatever i want let's just zoom out a little bit press upload and that zone is now my london zone with the uk flag and that gets used anywhere you see that zone so if i now for example went to deploy a vm okay london is now notated as a as a uh as a flag and anywhere i see that name most places i see that name uh let's have a look here what zone is this in yeah i've got my little flag in there so just making cloud stack more visual and other things like for example uh if i looked at users uh their accounts i could do this as the user i'm actually going to do it as the administrator on his behalf i take giles and I choose the icon and now I can choose my photo. Cut my head off, resize it and off we go. Okay, so it's all just about making the cloud stack experience, you know, more visual, uh, easier for people to understand, etc. And one really nice thing that's, that's worth mentioning there, if I, if I add a resource icon to a template, uh, uh, an instance, a virtual machine will inherit that icon. So uh, if I've got Windows logo, or li specific Linux distribution, but that then can be overwritten. I can then add icons to a specific machine to break that dependency between the two. So hopefully that just gives you a taste of, uh, of what's new in 416. So I'm going to sort of wrap, stop talking now. Nicholas is here with me uh, for any Q&A event. How are we doing for, uh, for, for questions? I need to have a look here, I think. Thank you, Giles. I will go through a few questions. And I believe that the first one is quite technical, probably for Nicholas. Uh, the question comes from Ray Paging. How does CloudStack handle backups for KVM instances or Xen instances? And is there any form of native integration with Veeam? I could do that. Uh, okay. Yeah, go ahead. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> That's um, your wish. Oh. So, so Cloud, Cloud, CloudStack traditionally hasn't had, uh, for years, traditionally didn't have its own native backup. Uh, solution. It had snapshotting through the hypervisor, but as I'm sure you're aware, snapshotting isn't a proper backup solution. In uh, 4.14, I think it was, 4.15, uh, we had a new feature in CloudStack called the CloudStack Backup and Recovery Framework. And this is a effectively an SDK for backup vendors to integrate with CloudStack. And I think Yvette there, the question was specifically around Veeam. Yeah, <laughs> the, exactly. The, fir the very first provider or driver for that framework was actually based on Veeam. So if you if you just look up CloudStack Backup and Recovery Framework Veeam, you will find that you add in that framework into CloudStack, and then the provider does the translation to the Veeam uh, API uh, endpoint. Did I get that right, Nicholas? I think I did. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I'm going to the next question, and it's uh, when people can upgrade to, to 4.16 and when it will be generally available. The 15th of November uh, will be the release date, which is, I think, a week from today. Uh, go for it after then. Next question What are the chances for a 4.15.3 release? Interesting. Uh, I don't know. I think I know some people have had discussions. Uh, the 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 dot releases at that level are generally because there are blocker issues in the existing branch. I'm not personally. I'm I'm not sure. I don't know who asked that question. Uh, if that whoever asked that, if they want to reach out to me, I will connect them into somebody with a much better understanding of whether that may happen or not. Uh, a few more questions around Kubernetes. Uh, does Kubernetes integrate with the storage natively? And does 4.16 Kubernetes feature support private Docker registry? I don't know the answer to either of those. Do you know, Nicholas? Mm, no, no, I have to check as well. 
Cheers. Should we maybe invite the people to the specific talk in regards to Kubernetes services in CoopStack? That's a really good idea, Yvette. Uh, obviously, this, this was just a summary of 416. Go to that talk, or again, whoever's asked that question, if you want to reach out to me, I could connect you into somebody who can answer those questions. And, I, and I'm happy to pop that on the event feed so other people can see that as well. Yeah, I see also in the Q&A uh, also other questions for Kubernetes, like does Kubernetes integrate with the storage natively? So please be sure all of you, you visit uh, the talk, which is about Kubernetes service in CloudStack, and I'm pretty sure you will get answers of all these questions in it. Uh, going back to questions. <laughs> That's an interesting one. What are you looking forward to in 4.17? Yeah, I just read that. I saw that pop up from Sean. That's a really good question. I'm going to give a really lazy answer to that. Uh, watch the sessions in this conference over the next three days, and there's your answer, right? So all of the things that people are talking about working on at the moment are the things that are going to go into to more than likely going to 4.17. Uh, Personally, I've seen a lot of the work that's going on around networking, uh, the virtual router, some of the clever stuff on BNFs. Uh, that stuff really interests me. But honestly, just look through the schedule, look at where people are doing talks on on ongoing projects. That's all what's going to end up in 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 four seventeen. Uh, Jess, according to you, what is uh, the most unique feature in 4.16 and what actually makes this release uh, much different than the previous ones? Uh, oh, good question. What is the most unique feature? <sighs> They're all unique by definition, but uh, there's maybe not one particular thing. There's not a new specific new, new area that you know things we haven't done before it's it's you know it's it's a lot of enhancing like the the new ui we were super excited to launch that but now we've got a whole load of enhancements i think really one of the most important things for me is to see vendors doing storage integrations uh and i know there's other vendors there's some talks here at this conference people other vendors who are looking at integrations with cloud stack at the moment and that just reflects this whole thing, you know, for years, and lots of people have heard me say it, talking about CloudStack struggling to get attention uh, compared to some of its 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 friends and neighbours in the in the space. And that is definitely changing. Absolutely, is 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 changing. And I think because you know, IaaS and that virtualized thing is, as Gartner would say, in the plateau of productivity now, right? So it's not the latest thing, it's not the latest hype thing, but so many people still rely on this. Uh, so many people are uh, adopting Cloud Stack at the moment. And for quite a long time there, the vendors weren't really interested in Cloud Stack. Now we're seeing them re-engaging because their customers are saying, look, we're running this, or we're about to deploy this, so they're needing to, to, to do integration. So actually it's not about those specific features, it's about what's behind those features and what's driven them a bit, I think is my answer to that one. And one more question. I've heard cloud stack upgrades are more smoother now with system VM template. Can you update on this? Yeah, well, this what I what I just mentioned there, the system VM template. Now you don't have to uh, you don't have to register it manually. So 416 will just do that for you. So yes, lot smoother. Uh, and that is all part of you know, a lot of work over the last three, four releases was this this vision that quite a few people in the community had about zero downtime upgrades. So upgrading CloudStack was easier than a lot of other IaaS uh, platforms, but was still the biggest pain point for people. And with every release, that's just getting easier and easier and easier. Okay, next question is going to be a little bit longer. For private cloud or deployments relying on traditional virtualization, full VMs as opposite to containers, what would be the argument for using cloud stack uh, as opposite to the traditional providers like VMware with vSphere or Hyper-V? Yeah, that's a good question. Good question. So, you know, for years we were, well, cloud stack was this layer on top of your virtualization. And now we've got people putting layers on top of cloud stack, right? Like Kubernetes and, and that sort of thing. The simple answer is about 
uh, abstraction. It's about putting that abstraction layer in. Uh, one of the key things to remember, you know, we assume everybody knows this, but CloudStack is hypervisor agnostic. It supports all of the major hypervisors. So rather than your, you know, your automation people writing a whole load of stuff that points at the VMware API or does, you know, does stuff directly with, uh, with KVM or Zen, CloudStack can provide that layer of abstraction. So you've got a common API, irrespective of what hypervisor your organization chooses now or in, in the future. And then also don't forget the core of what it is, it's an orchestration platform. So it brings self-service, It you know, and it, this is proven, it's been around years, there's thousands of organizations who are running it. So it allows users to, to, to self-serve them, you know, CloudStack, as does OpenStack, as does VM Cloud, VMware vCloud Director, gives that ability for whether it's through the API or just through a, a UI or through your code, through things like Terraform integration, stuff like that, to automate that infrastructure easily. But I think the you know the key thing with CloudStack is that hypervisor independence to create that abstraction layer away from away from just the virtualization technology. And one more question in terms of the versions of CloudStack. Uh, people are asking, isn't it time to move to 5. something? And what are the rules for incrementing the major version? So, okay, I'll share a secret. Uh, when we released the latest, the, the previous version, 4.15, with the lovely new interface, it looked very new, it got a load of new functionality. My view was like, hey, we should that should be 5, but using proper uh, semantic naming convention, we only need to move to five when we break the API. And we haven't managed to break the, we haven't broken the API. Uh, so from a pure, you know, compliance with that scheme viewpoint, you know, 416, 417, and it's a good thing. But I have to admit from a market perception viewpoint, we, people say, oh, you're stuck on four. We're not, we, we you know, you look at the functionality that's come along from 4.13 through 4.16, it's massive amounts of stuff that, that have gone in. It looks completely different. It's got support for more hypervisors, all sorts of things. We should have really moved that to five, but from a development perspective, we're doing the correct thing. We are staying on that number, that, that scheme. We will we will move when we uh, need to, to, to break the uh, API. And like so many things, with CloudStack, we're focusing on the technology, not on necessarily the market perception with the technology. Thank you very much, Giles. Since we are almost running out of time, I just want to use the case to thank you all and to thank you, uh, Nicholas, for managing the release. Uh, and in terms of the organization, uh, next talks will be separated in two tracks. We have a developer's track and we have a separate track for user stories and integration. So you can choose which session to visit. And if you're missing some session, we will have recordings which are on demand for all of them. Thanks, Giles. Thanks, guys. Thanks for listening. <laughs>